I watched Ron Howard's Apollo 13, the movie again. And of course, if what we're saying is true, that all that was another part of the play that they put on for us. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. I have a, a clip that sets it up, and I'll show you how uh, the Apollo 13 is another piece of absolute proof that the whole thing's a lie. Hold on a second. This is from a documentary um, that NASA did. The crew must reduce power consumption to just 12 amps, about the same as a household blender. We had to power down the guidance system, turn it off. We had to uh, power down the computer. Really all we had going for us was a radio to talk back to the Earth and a little fan to circulate the atmosphere. Okay, now, if you remember the story, and I just saw it again, and Ron Howard really stuck to what happened. Power is everything. What do you mean? We got to get them down to 12 amps. Oh, 12 12 amps. amps. How many? You can't, run, you can't run a vacuum cleaner on 12 amps, John. They spent three days, a full three days, going from the moon to the Earth, having turned off the power to where they only had enough juice to run a little fan. What they did was they moved the three guys into this tiny little lem. To stay alive, they have only one option. They'll have to evacuate into the lunar module, Aquarius. We want you to start getting over in the lem and getting some power on that. The lunar module has its own battery power supply. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, what it, that's the story. It's not arguable. You just heard it. Keep in mind, there's three guys in the LEM for three days, going from the moon to the Earth. Now, listen to this. If the LEM didn't have climate control would it, and had air in it, would it be hot or cold without the climate control? If you just took a, a lunar module and, the, well, let's take the climate control and it fails. All right, what happens then, you've got air in the setting there, it's, uh, it's uh, 70 degrees. Now, of course, when he says it fails, he's talking about the exact same situation that they had. They, they had no power, and you're starting out with the temperature 70 degrees, and let's see what happens. The lunar module is setting in the sun, which it always is. Then slowly but surely, that temperature inside is going to go up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you ain't going to make it because you're going to cook long before that. What you're powered the air conditioning? Uh, what powered the air batteries? You had a, a number of big batteries in the lunar module. They powered pumps, they powered the air conditioning, they powered the communication system. Notice that there's a difference between what he just said and what the documentary said. But powering down had another unwelcome effect. With the heaters switched off, the temperatures began to drop. We were losing more heat out into space than we were gathering from the sun. And therefore, gradually, the temperature kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And finally got down to about 34 degrees Fahrenheit in the lunar module, even colder than the command module. Temperature inside is going to go up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. It got very uh, cold and, and very, uh, very damp. In fact, they're polar opposites. According to the, to the documentary, the guy's saying it got cold in there. And according to the movie, it was cold in there. I'm a little worried about this cold affecting our, our battery efficiency. Alan Beam is saying that it would be 250 degrees. That temperature inside is going to go up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. The with the heaters switched off, with the heaters the switched off, began to drop. The heater, the air conditioning, temperature inside is going to go up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. With the heaters switched off, the temperatures began to drop. Now, to add to this, I'm going to play a clip about the construction of the limb. Hold on a second. The skin on the crew cabin was very thin, and that was all done because of weight savings. Weight was a very critical item that always had to be considered in anything that you did. If you really took your finger and poked hard at it, uh, you could poke right through the outer skin of the spacecraft. It was about the thickness of uh, two layers of uh, aluminum foil. But it's the kind of thing that you, uh, you were reasonably cautious 
that uh, you didn't jab any pointed objects uh, through. The skin, the aluminum alloy skin of the crew compartment was about 12 thousandths of an inch thick. That's equivalent to about three layers of Reynolds wrap that you would use in, in the kitchen. They're trying to tell us that those guys spent three days in this little capsule with no climate control at all. Let's kind of summarize this. This is a lot of information. Yeah. So on the one hand, the docudrama says the guys in Apollo 13 were coming back. They were real cold. It was 35 degrees. Right. The astronaut says, no, if you don't have the air conditioner working because of power or whatever, it's going to get 250 degrees in there. That's hot enough to bake cookies. Right. And then the other astronaut is saying, yeah, you could literally poke your finger through the side of the spacecraft. Right. That's, that's, I, ha I played it twice because two different guys that designed it, that's from Grumman, the, the guys that were interviewed about the construction of the LEM. The LEM. And, and one guy was, what's his name? And you always see uh, Krantz, the, the mission director, who I really don't like. You really took your finger and poked hard at it. Uh, you could poke right through the outer skin of the spacecraft. He's one of those, I mean, he's telling everything he says is not, is untrue, whether it's, you know, and he's one of those guys that's high and tight with his haircut, and, you know, we're not on my watch. We never lost an American in space. We're sure as hell not going to lose one on my watch. Out of problems are our business. And I thought, we're going to solve this problem, get back on track. Uh, no big deal. Kind of crap, and he's lying about everything. But your, you, your own research has shown the telemetry data is missing. That's, that's right. Uh, no big deal. But anyway, it seems to me that deep space is the most hostile environment, aside from being in the middle of the sun, probably in the universe. <laughs> and these guys spent three days cruising through this with <laughs> no climate control. Picture you take uh, 50 rolls of Reynolds wrap and you make a room out of it. The skin of the lunar module is so thin that you could punch a hole right through it. <laughs> With two layers. That's really exactly what they're saying they happened. And you put yourself in that. And then as a thought experiment, try this with a physicist and watch him squirm. Because if he's a working physicist, he has to buy into this lie. Otherwise, he won't get his funding. That's another part of this. And ask a physicist if you took, made a room out of tin foil, had air in it at 70 degrees, and you, and you put it in orbit the same distance from the sun that the Earth is, which is what happened, and ask him what would happen to the temperature inside after three days. Just the temperature. Forget about radiation. Um, and by the way, they didn't have them wear their spacesuits either. C they could have done that at least to not insult our intelligences well, to the extent that they did. I am sick and tired of the entire Western world knowing how my kidneys are functioning. Right, they didn't even have their spacesuit on, did they? No, they, no. They so, I mean, it's completely ridiculous. It's like somebody sitting in an in a oven while cookies are baking. Mark, it's even worse than that. It's more, it's so far out there. This is Odyssey. It's good to see you again. <laughs> and they're trying to tell us to believe that. And no it one. pisses me off. Melting rolling. No, no. Ah. I'm so sick of it. Yeah! <laughs> uh. It went from uh, the moon landings are boring after the first uh, two. Network stumped us. One of them said we made going to the moon about as exciting as taking a trip to Pittsburgh. To now it's drama in outer space. It's more dramatic now. So are our boys going to be uh, mar marooned in space? And this focuses renewed attention on Apollo. The unfolding drama in space instantly reignites press interest in the mission. There was an explosion. And, and the, the network TV coverage pulls no punches. Their oxygen supply is in jeopardy and their water supply is officially termed critical. One of the networks gives the crew a 10% chance of survival. If anything more goes wrong, the house and 
Senate passed resolutions calling on the American people to pray tonight for the astronauts. Ah! In Rome, Pope Paul led 50,000 people in prayers for the safe return of the astronauts. In Jerusalem, prayers at the Wailing Wall. And here's what gets to me. Picture, the whole world goes to see Apollo 13, right? And amongst the whole world, there are thousands and thousands of physicists and astronomers and cosmologists and guys that are just scientists. Now, what I'm asking is how come the day after the world went to see Apollo 13, why wasn't there a revolution the next day about us being lied to? Because what I'm saying, and you know, I got to tell you, I thought of this. Nobody else had brought this up about Apollo 13. So I give myself a little credit, but it also scares the hell out of me that I have to think of this. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> it, they're in well, space for three days with tin foil. Anyway, what I hope the people listening will do is not believe me, but do your own research. Go look into it, um, and you'll find everything I'm saying is true. Oh. And it's scary because what does that say, not only about us, the public, but what does it say about all the guys at NASA? Either they were all in on it, which I don't buy, right? or they were all in an Orwellian double-think denial delusion, which the rest of the world are living under. His mind slid away into the labyrinthine world of double-think. To know and not to know. To hold simultaneously two opinions, which cancelled out. To forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again. Now, everybody says you can't have a conspiracy because too many people would know. Well, in general, they don't tell everybody. It's compartmentalized. You could theoretically get away with the whole Apollo hoax with five people knowing about it, aside from the astronauts, just by feeding in, you know, the, uh, the video feed, that you, who knows where it's coming from? It comes into NASA. They assume it's coming from the moon or wherever. And so why should they think different? But how come someone didn't say, why aren't they either freezing to death or cooking? And why didn't, how could they survive the radiation? In 1959, I was working with advanced research at Rocketdyne. And their own studies proved that radiation levels on the moon were lethal. This corroborated Russian research. The Russians claimed that for a man to survive on the moon with the radiation emitted from solar and cosmic sources, he would have to be shielded by four feet of solid lead. These Lavelle outlined, as he had been intended to, in a letter to Hugh Dryden, NASA's deputy administrator. First, the Russians could see no immediate way of protecting cosmonauts from the lethal effects of solar radiation. I had frequently asked my Soviet contacts when they intended to send um, a human being to the moon, and their response was always when we can be absolutely certain of getting them back alive. They're not, if you, they're, there's these two little windows in the LEM. Mm -hmm. It's blue out there, a bright right. blue. I mean, didn't they even have enough respect for our intelligence to have it black <laughs> out there, which is the way it would be with space? <laughs> right. I mean, it's so out there that, yeah, I, you know what I mean? Reality control they called it. They, but you're, there's so many holes in their story. It's like 9-11, you know, in space. It's worse. It's, it's worse. worse. And, it's, pe and you're even considered crazier yeah. to say the moon landing was a hoax than if you're a 9-11 truther. Right. Right? right. They got us brainwashed to the point where physicists come out 
of Apollo, thir of Apollo 13, and, it's, and I'd be carted away to the loony bin, and they go and get money, you know, from the government to do their physics. How could that be? Well, you bring up such an interesting point of this whole Orwellian lie. I don't know a better way to put it. It's yeah. how, how can the world be under this much mind control? Right, right. That, that's really the ultimate question. And boy, um, that's the scary part of it. It really is. Because I, I hope people listening to this uh, will understand that that is really the point that I'm getting at here. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. The temperature kept dropping and dropping and dropping, and finally got down to about 34 degrees Fahrenheit. But it also scares the hell out of me that I have to think of this. Some other time we'll talk about stuff like HARP and um, the mind control thing that they've been doing since World War II and the fact that they can implant thoughts in people's heads now with uh, uh, ELF, uh, extreme low frequency waves. I don't know, you know Nick Begich, who I'm talking about, right? Right. Nick Begich? Yes. He, you know, you, you read his, his book or you look at him, you can see him on YouTube. The subtext of his work is so f profoundly frightening as to what they can do. You know, I'm not surprised by anything. There's a guy who did a, uh, a hypnotist in England, and you've got to see this video, it's on YouTube, that did a mind control thing to a whole shopping mall and got everybody to raise their right hand at the same time. He talked to them in this hypnotic kind of voice and told them a few things. And he didn't say, raise your right hand. He just said a word. And there's the camera shows up, 200 people all raising their right hand at the same time. So all those customers wishing to reach up and grab this exciting opportunity should do so now. I don't know, like everybody raised their hand. It was just weird because I'm walking around and he's like now and everybody raised their hand. Turned around and that like everyone had their hands yeah. up in the air. Just really Sorry. weird. Made their hands up too. <laughs> really odd. Sorry. Two hundred. Yeah, I, I I don't know how many people, but the whole shopping mall of people, he got them to raise their right hand just by talking to them, and making suggestions. Welcome to the Palisades Mall. We hope that your shopping experience is an uplifting arm, is an uplifting arm, is an uplifting arm. Neuro-linguistic -lingu programming, NLP. What you're hearing in the background is a public address announcement I've pre-recorded and played throughout the shopping center. After about half an hour of absorbing it, they should be ready for their final message. People are, are, are so much more suggestible and, and, and subject to delusion planted in their minds than, than, than we think they are. If it is necessary to rearrange one's memories, then it is necessary to forget that one has done so. You know, you have exactly the right for me reaction to everything we've, ta we've talked about. It's, it's not the fact that they faked the thing, it's how come nobody noticed? <laughs> you know, how could it be? See, That's the real question. 